In the mid-15th century, life was sweet on the banks of the River Loire. King Charles VII, nicknamed Charles the Victorious, had moved his court to Tours. The city's undulating ramparts touched the sky. The outlines of its towers and steeples rose up above the dense mass of houses. The violence of the Hundred Years' War had scarred the previous century. Battles, the plague, and famine had wiped out almost half of the population. The Kingdom of France was still divided. The roads were dangerous. Local militiamen were still armed. Brigands and highwaymen were on the loose. But in the presence of the king, and with the shelter of the walls of Tours, Crowds filled the streets lined with stores, workshops, and bourgeois homes. Behind one of these streets, in his studio, sometime between 1452 and 1461, the renowned painter Jean Fouquet was working on a painting called The Martyrdom of Saint Apollonia. What do we see? a bound saint being martyred by her executioners as they carry out acts of torture. A large crowd has gathered in a semicircle on the stands to witness the saint having her teeth pulled out. Naked, hirsute men armed with clubs, demons, angels, and death complete the scene. What meaning should we look for in this fantastical scene painted by one of the great French masters? To find out, we must examine the elements and the figures represented, seek to uncover the secrets behind this composition, and grasp what the artist is telling us about a period, its beliefs, and its fears. Let's get closer so we can see it in depth. Apollonia of Alexandria, a third century Christian martyr, tortured by the Romans and prepared to sacrifice her teeth in the name of her faith. Fouquet's painting is filled with thousands of details. And yet, it measures only 16 centimeters by 12, so it's actually an illumination. Like all limners, the term for illuminators, Jean Fouquet worked with a magnifying glass and probably with a black glass, which provided a reversed image, allowing him to view his work from a different angle. In the center is the serene face of Saint Apollonia. She's withstanding the pain in stillness, her features fixed in a mask of beatitude, highlighting the word of the church. Martyrs suffered for you. Your suffering is nothing compared to theirs, but heaven awaits them. The martyrdom of Saint Apollonia is a religious work, one of 47 miniatures that Fouquet produced to illuminate a book of hours. A book of hours is an illustrated devotional book filled with prayers, an aid for contemplation destined for laymen who wanted to strengthen their faith by praying at home, according to the seven canonical hours of prayer. It also included a calendar noting the main holy feasts and saints days. The manuscript on which Jean Fouquet was working was unique. It was a luxurious object, an original work of art. He used the maximum surface area of each page by eliminating the traditional floral borders and using the space generally reserved for the ornamental capital letter and integrating it into his composition. The illumination thus became a genuine painting. This innovation became the norm in the following centuries. Illuminations would be cut out and turned into individual works that would be propagated throughout the world. For 
are at the martyrdom of Saint Apollonia, as in all of his illuminations, Fouquet refused to use the classic depictions of her devotion. He invented entirely new compositions. The torture scene seems to be commentated by a man reading a text and conducting proceedings with a baton. The Roman Emperor Decius, accompanied by several courtesans, tries to persuade the saint to renounce her faith. As a sign of contempt, a buffoon undoes his hose and shows his buttocks. The saint is bound and at the complete mercy of her torturers. One of them pulls her hair with all his might, urged on by a black demon, while another uses huge pincers to pull out her teeth. In the stands, in the middle of the rowdy crowd, various areas of action are symbolized. In the center, the emperor's court with an empty throne, since he has descended the ladder to join in the scene. To the left, heaven, overlooked by God, dressed in red, and Saint Michael in gold. At their feet are angels ready to greet the saint. Thus the angels descended from on high, and when they were on earth, they span around the field without a sound. To the right, hell, reserved for the devil and his wife awaiting their prey. Beneath them, the jaws of hell gape open, revealing the damned. To the great joy of the onlookers, the jaws of hell close again, demons bear torches, angels fly, while figures appear and disappear in clouds of smoke. Let's look at the page that Fouquet dedicated to Job, the hero of the Old Testament. Sprawled on a dunghill, the old, poor, resigned and patient Job is plunged into the shade in a decidedly naturalist landscape. The trees are real trees, far from the barely shaped, stylized trees with limited color of the previous century. The scene has perspective, with, in the background, a castle keep. It's clearly identifiable as the Chateau de Vincennes near Paris. Job's friends betray their repugnance by raising their ample cloaks. Their bodies are brought to life beneath drapery whose volume is rendered with a perfect mastery of light and shade. Fouquet uses to the full the luminosity of gold, either with cross-shading or vibrant pointillism, to illuminate dark-colored cloth when it's in the sun and to model light-colored cloth when shaded. With vivacity in gestures and truth in movements, Fouquet is seeking to portray reality. But what of Saint Apollonia? Having already qualified the painting as fantastical, does it contain any of the realism found in Job? In fact, yes. The wooden stands overlooking the saint and her torturers turn the space into a kind of medieval theater in the round. The man with the baton thus becomes a master of ceremonies, the angels and demons scenery, and the clouds of smoke special effects called theatrical secrets. Fouquet invites us to a mystery play, a performance with the saint refusing to deny Christ. These plays, put on in towns, told holy tales, mysteries composed of a series of tableaus, mixing comic scenes and dramatic scenes interspersed with musical interludes. The play could last for several days and feature up to 500 people, including all the extras. The roles were filled by locals. In some families, the roles of Jesus and Judas were handed down from father to son.
Wanting to be both showy and realistic, medieval troops often hired real executioners to play themselves and used fake corpses, bloodied mannequins, ingeniously replaced by actors through trapdoors. Parts of the set had curtains that could be drawn over them. Behind them, backstage, the actors caught their breath and changed costumes between scenes. Fouquet captures perfectly the bubbling life of the theater where actors and spectators from all classes mingled. Mystery plays were essentially fleeting. The stands and sets scaffolded along the facades of houses were brought down after performances. Fouquet's illuminations are a unique testament. He knew the mysteries particularly well, as he was one of the most esteemed directors of his generation, a so-called master of secrets. In The Carrying of the Cross, another illumination from the Book of Hours, we see in the foreground Edouard, the blacksmith's wife, forging the nails of the crucifixion. This is a scene from The Mystery of the Passion, one of the most popular mysteries of the time. This illumination is a clear example of how Fouquet was able to free religious portraiture from its conventions as he strove to give each figure his or her own individual identity. Very early on, Fouquet was recognized as a master portraitist, and it was as such that he was commissioned during his stay in Rome to paint Pope Eugene IV. The work would be lost, but is known through two copies. Fouquet's portrait of the Pope depicts a complex personality, tight lips which show his seriousness, and a rigidity in the firmly modeled facial muscles. Features which reveal the artist's very personal approach to portraiture. Jean Fouquet had made the long and dangerous journey to Italy a dozen years earlier, when war was raging along the roads of France. To reach Rome safely, it's likely that he joined a band of pilgrims. He would spend several years in Italy. After his stay in Rome, he left for Florence, where he would have seen the innovative work of the Tuscan painters, and then for Mantua, where he is thought to have painted the buffoon Gonella. He stopped off in Padua, then moved on to Venice, where he met local artists such as Andrea del Castagno and Jacopo Bellini. Few canvases have survived, but Fouquet made a lasting impression in Italy. The Florentine, Francesco Florio, wrote in a letter dated 1478. With his ease in the art of painting, Jean Fouquet has risen not only above his contemporaries, but above the elders. Have no doubt, for it is the truth that I write. This Fouquet has the power with his brush to bring faces to life. In the crucifixion in his Book of Hours, the disposition of the crosses closely resembles that of his Florentine contemporary, Fra Angelico. But close observation of the Flemish master Jan van Eyck's work shows that Fouquet is closer to him in the exact rendering of textures, a taste for expressive faces, the modeling of the bodies, and a way of making the light shimmer. Fouquet was not really a man of the Italian Renaissance rediscovering antiquity. However, during his stay in Italy, he did learn the articulated compositions through a subjacent geometry, which, thanks to the rules of perspective, as laid out by Alberti, allowed him to create the illusion of depth. And he played with this perspective, here creating a circular scene that brings to mind the Roman amphitheaters where the first Christians were put to death. In his Book of Hours, Fouquet used this page setting recurrently. A central circular area, and in the foreground, the same savages bearing the same coat of arms. These traditional feast day carnival figures, symbolizing harmonious life with nature, are presenting the arms of the man who commissioned the Book of Hours, Etienne Chevalier. 
In 1453, Etienne Chevalier was Charles VII's treasurer and a member of his council. After a century of war, France had changed for good. The king distrusted the feudal nobility and instead promoted new men to his kingdom's ranks of power, many of them recently ennobled wealthy bourgeois like Etienne Chevalier. He was sufficiently rich to commission from Fouquet, other than the Book of Hours, a painting for the church Notre-Dame de Melun. The Melun diptych, as it would come to be known, features on the left Etienne Chevalier praying before a virgin and child. On the right, in the background, the bright red angels stand out with the translucent purity of their complexions. The Virgin Mary bears the features of Agnès Sorel, the influential mistress of the king, then deceased. She had appointed Etienne Chevalier as the executor of her will. In the Book of Hours, Fouquet chose his subjects to please Etienne Chevalier. Echoing the Melun diptych, he represented Chevalier praying before a virgin and, with a degree of daring, even anticipated his patron's funeral. But he didn't stop at featuring the king's treasurer. A few pages on, in the Adoration of the Magi, the king kneeling on a carpet decorated with fleur-de-lis and offering the infant Jesus gold is none other than Charles VII. To the left in the distance, three heralds sound the outcome of a battle. A star spreads its light over the battlefield, a probable allusion to the king's victory over the English that very year, 1453. The life and reign of Charles VII were consumed by the Hundred Years' War. A century of dynastic conflict between the Plantagenet, supporting England, and the House of Valois, faithful to the throne of France. A succession of alliances with dukes and lords, and a weakening of the kings of France and their kingdom. Charles VII, whose enemies mockingly nicknamed the King of Bourges, managed to turn the military situation to his favor. 25 years earlier, he had crossed France with Joan of Arc, to be crowned king in Reims. But beyond this symbolic act, France remained a divided country. Charles VII knew that to unite it, he needed to put across the image of a strong sovereign. Fouquet would help him by painting the illuminations for the great chronicle of France, a manuscript written by those close to the king which tells of the history of France through its monarchs. In his illustrations, Fouquet celebrates the monarchy by depicting famous battles, royal entrances, and coronations. No fewer than 11 crownings allowed Fouquet to highlight this religious ceremony during which the ruler becomes king by divine right. Fouquet thus became a history painter and, by extension, a propagandist. He painted the so-called Lit de Justice de Vendôme, the parliamentary trial of dukes and lords who had opposed Charles VII. Here, impassive and serene, the king presides, from his bed, over the trial of the blood prince, the Duc d'Alençon, charged with treason. Only one figure looks at the viewer. Fouquet, thus proclaiming himself a trustworthy eyewitness of the scene. Fouquet associates the crowd with the event, therefore portraying the king at his height, the master of his subject's fate. Despite the small scale of his works, Fouquet liked to paint crowds and their movements. In The Martyrdom of St. Apollonia, the spectators constitute a coherent group, fully involved in the ongoing violence. All eyes are on the main subject of the work, pointed out by the long pincers which cut across the scene as they break and rip out St. Apollonia's teeth. At the time, dentistry was in its early days. Rotten teeth were extremely dangerous and were a constant torment, symbolized by Saint Apollonia, who would become the patron saint of dentists. One
one either suffered or gave oneself up to treatment by barbers. Barbers were the lowest rung of the medical ladder after surgeons and doctors, and they were only allowed to operate on non-mortal wounds. Anesthetizing patients with a sponge soaked in a concoction of nightshade juice, opium, and Indian hemp. They extracted teeth with pliers, root genes, straight and curved spatulas, pincers, and the brand new invention, the pelican. The more skillful barbers were able to stabilize a loose tooth by lacing it to its neighbor or to replace it with a handcrafted piece of oxbone. They treated a hole in a tooth by filling it with a clove or by cauterizing it with a red-hot needle. There's an old popular saying in France, tooth pullers are liars as they easily promise a happy outcome for all things. It was often safer to implore Saint Apollonia, who during her martyrdom prayed to God to ask him to relieve the toothaches of anyone who invoked her name. Pain and suffering are major themes of Fouquet's paintings. This body of work echoes a troubled time. The king authorized the forming of bloodthirsty militia groups to fight dukes and lords who dared contest his authority. Like society, painting, mystery plays, and religious texts were full of these strikingly raw depictions of violence. The horrors of the cruelty and torture suffered by the early Christians under the Roman Empire are told with extraordinary narrative verve in the Golden Legend, written in 1260 by the Archbishop of Genoa, Jacobus de Vorgine. His tales met with huge success, and Fouquet was largely inspired by them for his Book of Hours. Now it is time to come to other kinds of torture, beginning with that which consisted of cutting off one or both breasts of a woman in order to induce the greatest possible pain. In the mystery dedicated to Saint Barbara before the main mutilation scene, she has already been flogged, had her flesh torn with iron pincers, been burned with flaming torches, and been smashed in the head with iron mallets. Finally, Having had her breasts ripped off, she was forced to walk through the city naked. Saint Barbara was far from being an isolated case. Agatha, Agnes, Anastasia, Catherine, Cecile, Christine, and Honorina were either burned alive, thrown to the lions, had their eyes gouged out, their tongues cut out, were impaled, had their legs broken, their feet and hands cut off, and of course their teeth pulled out, which brings us back to Saint Apollonia. Some commentators see the man doing up his pants as a sign that he has just performed ignoble acts on Saint Apollonia. A debatable interpretation for sure, but one that is coherent with this omnipresent representation of violence and towards women in particular. The martyrdom of Saint Apollonia and the other works in the Book of Hours are one of the last examples of medieval art which Fouquet took to its peak. It was a pivotal time for art as it was for France. After the terrible bloodshed that decimated the country, the situation gradually improved. By the end of his reign, Charles VII had securitized the realm thanks to a permanent professional army and thanks to a modern fiscal and administrative system put in place by Etienne Chevalier and his consorts. Fouquet was a central figure in this renewing, transforming France. By using the allegory of a theater play, the martyrdom of Saint Apollonia gives viewers a form of distance from the violence. This detachment, however slight it may be, marks a first step to a new way of seeing the world. With his tiny, delicate paintbrush, Fouquet laid the first stones of a budding humanism 
and heralded the dawning of a new era just over the horizon.